Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the WikiClick Podcast. As always, this is Kyle Hellcam. Uh, last time we did... God, what do we do? I'm blanking out. I know we did one on ancient Egypt. And I, oh, Toxoplasmosis is where we started. Uh, today we're going to start with the Elephant's Graveyard. Elephant's Graveyard is something I've always heard about, but I don't know too much about. I know that Lion King, Disney's Lion King mentioned it. And I want to find out what they are. Do elephants really kind of go to a certain location? Let's find out. Elephant's Graveyard. An elephant's graveyard is a mythical place where, according to legend, older elephants instinctively direct themselves when they reach a certain age. They would then die there, alone, far from the group. Well, already it sounds like this is a mythical place. The origin. Several theories are given about the myth's origin. One theory involves people finding groups of elephant skeletons together or observing old elephants and skeletons in the same habitat. Others suggest the term may spring from group die-offs, such as one excavated in Saxony and Halt, which had 27 Paleoloxodon antiquus skeletons. Huh. Let's look up those skeletons, because as always, it's hilarious whenever I can't pronounce what I'm supposed to be reading. Oh, well, it directs me to an easily pronounced straight tusk elephant. The article, straight tusk elephant. The straight tusk elephant is an extinct species of elephant that inhabited Europe during the middle and late Pleistocene, which took place uh, 781,000 years ago to 50,000 years before present. Some experts regard the larger Asian species Paleoxodon namidicus as a variant or subspecies. It was formerly thought to be closely related to the living Asian elephant. However, in 2016, DNA sequence analysis showed that its closing extent relative is actually the African forest elephant. It is closer to El- it is closer to the forest elephant than the African forest elephant is to the African bush elephant thus invalidating the genus Loxodonta as currently recognized. So essentially, this extinct straight-tusked elephant is more closely related to the African um, forest elephant than the African forest elephant is to the African bush elephant. That's interesting. Uh, The straight-tusked elephant was quite large, with individuals reaching 4 meters, or 13.1 feet, in height. One approximately 40-year-old male measured 3.81 meters, or 12.5 feet tall, and weighed about 11.1 tons, or 12.5 short tons. Tons, they have short tons, they have long tons. This guy was heavy. Well, another form, another from Montreal, weighed about 15 tons. Let's go up and look at the um, let's look at the Asian elephant because I was actually unaware that such an elephant existed. I knew that elephants were in Asia, but I always heard that Africa was the land of elephants. So let's see what Asia's got going on. The Asian elephant is the only living species of the genus Elephas and is distributed in Southeast Asia from India and Nepal in the west to Borneo in the south. Three subspecies are recognized. E.M. Maximus from Sri Lanka, E.M. Indicus from mainland Asia, and E.M. Sumatranus from the island Sumatra. The Asian elephant is the Asian elephant is the largest living land animal in Asia. Okay, so these elephants are the largest living animal. The article's kind of worded strange. That's something you'll come across on Wikipedia sometimes. These are written by people and edited by people. And sometimes kind of use a little bit awkward language. That's all right. I'm still learning. Since 1986, the Asian elephant has been listed as endangered on the IUCN red list, as the population has declined by at least 50% over the last three generations, estimated to only be 60 to 75 years. It is primarily threatened by loss of habitat, habitat degradation, fragmentation, and poaching. In 2003, the wild population was estimated between 41,410 and 52,345 individuals. 
So that's pretty low. Let's look up Sumatra while we're here. Uh, I've heard about it. I know that that immor- <laughs> so much of a nerd I am. I know that the uh, immortal guy from the DC comics, the immortal bad guy, came from Sumatra. Sumatra is an Indonesian island in Southeast Asia that is part of the Sunda Islands. Sumatra has a wide range of plant and animal species, but has lost almost 50% of its tropical rainforest in the last 35 years. Many species are now critically endangered, such as the Sumatran ground cuckoo, the uh, Sumatran tiger, the Sumatran elephant, the Sumatran rhinoceros, and the Sumatran orangutan. Deforestation on the island has also resulted in serious seasonal smoke haze over neighboring countries, such as the 2013 Southeast Asian haze, causing considerable tensions between Indonesia and affecting countries uh, Malaysia and Singapore. Hmm, that's interesting that this smoke haze was enough to cause uh, tension between these countries. Sumatra was known in ancient times by the Sanskrit names of it's impronounceable, but in parentheses, it translates to Island of Gold and Land of Gold because of the gold deposits in the island's highlands. Say that five times fast. Island's highlands. The first mention of the name Sumatra was in the name of in the name of Srivijayan Haiji, King, King of the Land of Sumatra, who sent an envoy to China in 1017. Arab geographers referred to the island as Lamri or Lamuri, Lambri or Ranmiri in the 10th through 13th centuries, in reference to a kingdom near modern day Banda Akha, which was the first landfall for traders. One of these days, I'm going to have a nice string of articles with easily pronounced words. That day is not today. Let's go back up and let's look at the. Um, 2013 Southeast Asian Haze. I've never heard of this, but it's interesting that a pollutant such as this, an event involving pollution, would cause tensions. The 2013 Southeast Asian Haze was a haze crisis that affected several countries in Southeast Asia, including Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Southern Thailand, mainly during June and July of 2013. The haze period was caused by large-scale burning in many parts of Sumatra and Borneo. Satellite imagery from NASA's Terra and Aqua satellites showed that the haze was mainly due to smoke from fires burning in Rayu Province, Indonesia. The 2013 Southeast Asian haze was notable for causing record high levels of pollution in Singapore and several parts of Malaysia. The three-hour pollution standards index in Singapore reached a record high of 401 on the 21st of June, 2013, surpassing the previous record of 226 set during the 1997 Southeast Asian haze. Wow, so that was not quite, but getting close to double the uh, haze level, I suppose it would be, the uh, pollution standard index. That's kind of, that's incredible, not in a good way, but certainly fascinating. Let's, um, this is a rather long article where it ha- you know, has the chronologic events listed out and, uh, it details a lot of illegal wildfires and let's look up the, uh, let's move on to Borneo. It's a nearby Island. And, and rather than just kind of getting too in depth into one article, I kind of like to skip, skip my stones along the water surface as it were. Borneo is the third largest island in the world and the largest in Asia. Now that I did not know. At the geog- geographic center of maritime Southeast Asia, in relation to the major Indonesian island, it is located north of Java, west of Sulawesi, and east of Sumatra. The island is politically divided among three ca- countries, Malaysia and Brunei in the north, and Indonesia in the south. Approximately 73% of the island is Indonesian territory. That's kind of cool that a single island like that has little chunks bitten out of it of three different countries. 
I know that there are some islands out there that have two countries, like um, you have the Dominican Republic and Haiti, which are two parts, one island. Don't don't Google that. But to have an island with three different um, legal bodies presiding over that's kind of that's that's fascinating. Um, let's look up uh, the. It says the third largest island in the world. Let's look up a list of it's. Go to this list of islands by area. Because obviously Australia, everyone knows Australia is the biggest. Um, huh. Although continental landmasses listed below are not normally called islands, by definition, a landmass cannot be both an island and a continent. They are, in fact, land entirely surrounded by water. In effect, they are enormous islands and are shown here for that reason. The figures are approximations and are for the continental mainland only. I, as a kid, always contended that continents were just simply giant islands in the water. And sure enough, Wikipedia got my back on this one. So the landmass, the Afro-Eurasian landmass, is certainly the largest at 32,811,167 square miles. At just over half are the Americas at 16,428,000 square miles. And you could probably divide that in two because you've got the um, uh, Panama Canal there dividing North and South America from one another. So really, if you want to be technical, you could probably say that these are two different islands. Uh, Antarctica is about 5,400,000 square miles. And Australia is 2,932,578 square miles. Huh. Now that's interesting. They have Australia listed. They say it doesn't count as an island because it can't be both a continent and an island. Now growing up as a kid, I always I was always taught that Australia is the largest island. So now it's pretty fascinating that I guess the terms have changed. Because, yeah, I'm looking at this right now. It's not considered an island, guys. Australia, you're off the hook. I mean, you're still on the hook for the other things you do, and you know what they are. But you're no longer an island, guys. Congratulations. Welcome to the Big Boys Club. So here's a list of the actual islands. You've got Greenland at number one. At just at uh, 822,700 square miles. I'm not going to read the areas, but then you have New Guinea, followed by Borneo, Madagascar, Baffin Island, Sumatra. Look up Baffin Island. It's in Canada. Now I know that Northern Canada is kind of, Northern Canada kind of dissolves into the ocean the farther north it goes and you've got all those little islands. Baffin Island in the Canadian territory of Nunavut is the largest island in Canada and the fifth largest island in the world. Its area is 195,928 square miles and its population is about 11,000. That's not a lot. It is located and then it gives the coordinates named after English explorer, William Baffin. It is likely that the island was known to pre-Columbian Norse explorers from Greenland and Iceland. And then it was the location of Haluland, Spoken of in the Icelandic sagas. Uh, the Grunlandiga saga and the saga of Eric the Red. <clears throat> Equaliut, and I'm going to butcher these pronunciations because they are Inuit. And uh, just as an aside, the Inuit have a fascinating language. If you ever get a chance, go ahead and Google search their language. They use characters that we don't. And if you saw it written out, it almost looks like an alien language. It's pretty cool. Um, Iqaluit is the capital of Nunavut and is located on the southeastern, southeastern coast. Until 1987, the town shared the name <clears throat> Frobisher Bay with the bay on which it is located. I guess in 1987, they got tired of just being confused with the bay and renamed themselves. To the south lies Hudson Strait. 
separating Baffin Island from mainland Quebec. Quebec. South of the western end of the island is the Furian Hecla Strait. Uh, that's a name. <clears throat> <clears throat> I apologize for my throat there. Which separates the island from the Melville Peninsula on the mainland. To the east are Davis Strait and Baffin Bay, with Greenland beyond. I'm looking at a um, picture at one of the fjords on this island, and it looks absolutely beautiful. <clears throat> I want you to imagine some giant rocky cliffs terminating in the ocean, atop of which are giant mounds of snow. A um, To the right of these cliffs, you have like an incline going down to the ocean, and you have a glacier that is slowly seeping downward. It looks fascinating. <clears throat> let's go back up and let's look at the um, saga of Eric the Red. I've heard of Eric the Red. Wasn't he, I think he was a Viking, a very big, strong, brute a Viking guy. Let's find out if the saga confirms these rumors. <clears throat> let's see. Ericus Saga Rale. Or the Saga of Eric the Red is a saga thought to have been composed before 1265 on the Norse exploration of North America. Despite the name, the saga mainly chronicles the life and expedition of Thorfinn Karlsefni and his wife Gudrid, characters also seen in the Greenland saga. <clears throat> the saga also details the events that led to Eric the Red's banishment to Greenland and Leif Erikson's preaching of Christianity, as well as his discovery of Vinland after his long ship was blown off course. <clears throat> By geographical details, this place is thought to be present-day Newfoundland. It was probably the first European discovery of the American mainland, some five centuries before Christopher Columbus's arrival in the Antilles. That's kind of cool that I knew that the Norse had discovered America first, well... Insofar as you can discover a continent that's already inhabited by people. But from the European perspective, which is often where, because when you're writing history, you have to set a point and say, from this perspective, what happens? So from the European perspective, which is the history that is classically taught in the West, uh, this would be the first time that Europe was able to interact and discover the Americas. Uh, <clears throat> the saga is preserved in two manuscripts in somewhat different versions, Huxbok and Skullsbok. Modern philologists believe that the Skullsbok would be true of the original. The original saga is thought to have been written in the 13th century. <clears throat> Let's get a, a chapter synopsis. There are five chapters. This will be a little bit longer read, but I think that it's good to get a little bit of a plot summary. And I'll try and make it as interesting as possible. Chapter one. The saga starts off by explaining Olaf's ancestry and details events that happened regarding Olaf's wife, Odd, and Olaf's son, Thorstein the Red. When Olaf dies in battle in Ireland, Thorstein and Odd left for the Hebrides where Thorstein marries and became a great warrior king who ruled more than half of Scotland. Upon Thorstein's death, Odd sails to Iceland, where she then occupies much of the land. <laughs> Yo mama so fat, she sailed to Iceland and occupied most of the land. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> no, I understand what they're saying there. It's interesting that they started off with a, uh, <clears throat> an, a detailed account of their ancestry, the Bible and other holy texts actually tend to do the same thing. And I think that it's neat that geneolo genealogy plays such an important role in these um, bigger sagas. Chapter two, Eric's, uh, this is Eric, son of Thorvald. <clears throat> His thralls, which were Viking owned slaves, started a landslide that destroyed a farm. In retaliation, a friend of the farm owner, Yoljof the Fowl killed the thralls. Because of this, Eric then killed Iljof the Fowl. Iljof's kinsmen then demand that he be banished from that area, the area of being Hakaldor. 
Eric left to Oxney, where he asked Thorgest to keep some of the, his mystical beams. Thorgest would not give them back, so Eric took them by force and ended up killing two of Thorgest's sons. Thorgest and Eric each acquired a following. Then, at the Thorsness thing, Eric and his people were outlawed from Iceland. <clears throat> Eric then sailed to Greenland, where he named many places. Then he came back to Iceland and reconciled with Thorga, Thorgest. Then he decided to go back to Greenland and recruit people to come with him. He named the land Greenland because men will desire much the more to go there if the land has a good name. It, and that was something that I always thought was cool. If you look at a map, Greenland is covered in ice and Iceland is just covered in green. Those names definitely got split. Chapter 3. Thorbjorn had a daughter named Gudrid. Einar, a successful traveling merchant, wanted to marry Gudrid, but Thorbjorn did not think he was successful enough. Additionally, Thorbjorn was starting to have financial issues, so he decided to leave with his family to Greenland and find Eric the Red. Huh. That's pretty cool. Chapter 4. There is a prophetess named Thorbjorg who dresses very eloquently. Now, see, I thought Thorbjorg was a guy, but I guess prophetess named Thorbjorg, and she dressed very eloquently. One night she went to Thorkell's to deliver prophecies and eventually needed assistance from someone else who knew wired songs. Gudrid said she learned these wired songs from her foster mother back in Iceland. Gudrid sang them beautifully, and then Thorbjorg told of her prophecy that Greenland's dearth will last no longer, and Gudrid's offspring will have bright futures. Then Thorbjorn sailed and found Eric the Red, who gave him land and buildings. Uh, oh, Thorbjorn and Thorbjorg. Two different names. The last letter being... Okay. Okay. So it sounds like after all of this, <clears throat> this sounds like Eric the Red is only tenuously related to the saga bearing his name. Let's find out in the last chapter if he makes a if this is a redemption arc. Eric the Red's sons in chapter 5 were Leif and Thorstein. Leif had gone to Norway to being with King Olaf. Olaf suggested that Leif preach Christianity in Greenland, and Leif agreed. On his way back to Norway, Leif was tossed about a long time at sea and accidentally discovered a land with wild wheat, large trees, vine trees, and maple trees. And this is presumably somewhere in North America. He then sailed back on course to Greenland, where he converted many people to Christianity, including his mother. Eric the Red did not convert, and his wife withheld intercourse with him because of this. Leif wanted to... <laughs> I'm sure that Eric was just absolutely livid at Leif for getting his wife to convert to a religion that he refused to convert to. And then because she was that religion and he refused, she, she was not going to have sex with him. Leif wanted to go back to this newly discovered land with his father, but Eric thought it was unlucky because he fell off his horse on the way to the ship. Well... Maybe. I mean, the Europeans had varying degrees of luck with the uh, Americas. I certainly think that if any people were capable of taming the wild land, so to speak, it would have been the Vikings more so than the um, mainland Europeans centuries later. The mainland Europeans centuries later are used to civilization insofar as they have cities, they have places where you farm places where you live, uh, the way that you, they're, they're used to a very, I guess you could say sedentary lifestyle in so far as their buildings were in one place, whereas the Vikings were a much more mobile people. Uh, they did build cottages and houses and what have you, but they were also more available and more able to go on the run. And they were able to take to the seas far more efficiently. Furthermore, if you ever look at a map, of uh, <clears throat> Europe relative to America, 
and when I say a map, do a globe because that's more efficient. Look at where the Europe Europe is relative to America. If you sail out from like the Portuguese area where Columbus did, you're going to have a long, absolutely disgusting trip at sea lasting months and months. If you look north from Scotland to the Faroe Island, um, what, that's about a day? From Faroe to Iceland, that's about a day. From Iceland to Greenland, maybe that's about a day. And from Greenland to uh, Newfoundland, it's about a day. I mean, maybe more than a day, but you can island skip. You can hop from one body into the next. And that's a much more efficient route. So, I don't know. Let's look up the Norse exploration of North America. Because we know what we're always commonly taught. Let's see the uh, the first explorers. The Norse exploration of North America began in the late 10th century AD when Norsemen explored and settled areas of the North Atlantic, including the northeastern fringes of North America. Remains of North buildings were found at Lansiach Meadows near the northern tip of Newfoundland in 1960. This discovery aided in the reignition of the archaeological exploration for the Norse in, North, in the North Atlantic. The Norse settlements in Greenland lasted for almost 500 years. The only confirmed continental North American settlement, Lance Achmedos, was small and did not last as long. While voyages, for example to collect timber, are likely to have occurred for some time, there's no evidence of any lasting Norse settlements on mainland North America. That's a pity. It would be interesting if the uh, Portuguese came over and learned that they had been uh, beaten by about half a millennia by the <laughs> savages to the north. According to the sagas of Icelanders, Norsemen from Iceland first settled Greenland in the 980s. There's no reason. There's no special reason to doubt the authority of the information that the saga supply regarding the very beginning of the settlement, but not be treated as primary evidence for the history of Norse Greenland, because they embody the literary preoccupations of writers and audiences in medieval Iceland that are not always reliable. So the guys telling these stories may have had ulterior motives. They're probably perhaps trying to entertain or some such. Eric the Red having been banished from Iceland for manslaughter, explored the uninhabited southwestern coast of Greenland during the three years of his banishment. He made plans to entice settlers to the area, naming it Greenland on the assumption that people would be eager to go there because the land had a good name. The inner reaches, I don't think you would get very many people biting on that bait if you named it Land of Ice and Snow and nothing else. The inner reaches of one long fjord named Eric's Fjord, after him, was where he eventually established his estate, Bratalid. He issued tracts of land to his followers. Let's look up Bratalid. Bra of often anglicized, which is what we're going to do. Anglicized as Bratalid, Bratald, Bratalid was Eric the Red's estate in the eastern settlement Viking colony he established in southwestern Greenland toward the end of the 10th century. The present settlement of Kwasiarsuk, approximately 5 kilometers southwest from the Narsuk settlement, is now located in its place. The site is located about 60 miles from the ocean at the head of the Tunalifik Fjord, and hence sheltered from ocean storms. Eric and his descendants lived there until about the mid-15th century. The name Brathalid means the steep slope. <clears throat> huh. At Brathalid stood probably the first European church in the Americas. Now that's fascinating. I guess Greenland is considered part of the Americas. I've always considered it more European, but I'm sure that the Europeans do the same. It's the, it's the island nation with no home. By God, Greenland, we'll take you. 
uh, let's see, Fjordhild's church, actually a small chapel. A recent reconstruction of this chapel now stands at a distance from the actual site, along with a replica of a Norse longhouse. Let's look up the Norse longhouse. I know that they lived in them. I've heard of them. A longhouse is a type of long, proportionately narrow, single-room building built by peoples in varying parts of the world, including Asia, Europe, and North America. Many were built from timber and often represent the earliest form of permanent structure in many cultures. Types include the Neolithic longhouses of Europe, the stone medieval Dartmoor longhouse, which also housed livestock, and the various types of longhouses built by different cultures among the indigenous peoples of the Americas. Let's look at the Neolithic longhouse. I know, I know, you're getting sick of me going back through history. Well, I'm not sick of it. There's just so much of it. God, how, what percentage of your life has, like what? If you're lucky, you live 100 years. That's not even touching history. You don't get into the good rich stuff until you're about three or 4,000 years back. So we're going to go back and look at all the other cool stuff that people built before we were born. The Neolithic Longhouse was a long, narrow timber dwelling built by the first fathers in Europe, beginning at least as early as the period 5000 to 6000 BC. They first appeared in Central Europe in connection with the early Neolithic cultures, such as the Linear Pottery Culture or the Cucuteni Culture. This type of architecture represents the largest freestanding structure in the world in its era. Longhouses are present across numerous regions and time periods in the archaeological record. The longhouse was rectangular was a rectangular structure, 5.5 to 7 meters wide, of variable length, around 20 meters, but up to 45 meters. That's a pretty nice house. Outer walls were wattle and daub, sometimes alternating with split logs with pitched thatched roofs supported by rows of poles three across the in- exterior walls could have been quite short beneath a large roof they were solid and massive oak posts being preferred clay for the daub was dug from pits near the house which were then used for storage that's smart extra posts at one end may indicate a partial second story some linear pottery culture houses were occupied for as long as 30 years. Now, see, 30 years doesn't seem like a long time to occupy a house. Especially if you're back in the day, you know, you probably got the extended family living in, with you. I, I would imagine it would have to last a lot longer, but let's look at the linear pottery culture. I've never heard of them. <clears throat> the linear pottery culture is a major archaeological horizon of the European Neolithic, flourishing from about 5500 to 4500 BC. It is abbreviated as LBK, from the German Linear Bandkeramik, and is also known as the Linear Bandware, Linear Ware, Linear Ceramics, or Incised Ware Culture. Let's see, scroll down a little bit. The dentist evidence for the culture is on the middle dot Danube, the upper and middle Elbe, and then the upper and middle Rhine. Hmm. So it seems kind of like a very German, kind of French area, Austria. It represents a major event in the initial spread of agriculture in Europe. The pottery after which it was named consists of simple cups, bowls, vases, and jugs without handles, but in a later phase with lugs or pierced lugs, bases, and necks. Hmm. Let's scroll down and see. Let's look at its culture. Huh. Even has a, uh, this is a very rather long article. So, you know, whenever you come across one, you're a little shell shocked. I'm going to look up the uh, culture and then I'm going to scroll down because it actually has a uh, subsection for the economy. Um, let's see. The earliest theory of linear pottery culture origin is that it came from the something 
the Strakovo Koros culture of Serbia and Hungary. Supporting this view is the fact that the LBK appeared earliest, about 5600 to 5400 BC, on the Middle Danube and the Strakovo range. Presumably, the expansion northwards of the early Strakovo Koros produced a local variant reaching the upper Tizza that may have well been created by contact with the native Epigalithic people. Woo, this small group began a new tradition of pottery, substituting engravings for the paintings of the volcanic cultures. Okay, so these are just theories about the uh, cultures. and Let's look up uh, the economy. The LBK people settled on, a fluvial, on fluvial terraces and in proximities of rivers. <clears throat> They were quick to identify regions of fertile loess, and loess is a uh, classic, predominantly silt-sized sediment that is formed by the accumulation of windblown dust. On it, they raised a distinctive assemblage of crops and associated weeds in small plots, an economy that called a garden type of civilization. The difference between a crop and a weed in LBK context is the frequency. Are wheat and corn wheat, peas and lentils. Species that are found so rarely as to warrant classification as possible weeds are barley, millet, rye, bitter vetch, or broad or field beans. <clears throat> I wonder how they determine that though. They say that these appeared rarely, so they must be considered weeds. How do we know they weren't just considered specialty crops at the time? Because we know that barley, millet, rye, we know all of these were used um, <clears throat> to create food stuff throughout history. And if you were to, for instance, excavate the um, fields in America, you'd get a lot of corn, a lot of soy, a lot of wheat. You would have a few grapes. But grapes most certainly are not weeds, and we purposely try and cultivate them. It's just not economically sound to cultivate grapes throughout most of the country. So I'm wondering if maybe perhaps... Now again, this is all speculation on my part, because uh, I am most certainly not a um, not an expert on this. I'm just a guy reading off of Wikipedia. But... I'm wondering, maybe these were just other crops they attempted to grow. Oh, pardon me, that's the uh, phone. I have to answer that. It's, they'll be, they'll pick it up in the other room here. <clears throat> the emmer and the corn were sometimes grown as maislin or mixed crops. The lower yield end corn pr predominates over emmer which has been attributed to its better resistance to heavy rain. Hemp and flax gave the LBK people the raw material of rope and cloth, which they no doubt manufactured at home as cottage industry. Let's look up hemp. I always thought that that was a North American thing, but perhaps I was wrong. Hemp, or industrial hemp, typically found in the Northern Hemisphere is a variety of the cannabis sativ plant species that is grown specifically for the industrial uses of its derived products. It is one of the fastest growing plants and was one of the first plants to be spun into usable fiber 10,000 years ago. It can be refined into a variety of commercial items including paper, textiles, clothing, biodegradable plastics, paint, insulation, biofuel, food, and animal feed. Goodness gracious. Although cannabis as a drug and industrial hemp both derive from the species Cannabis sativa and contain the psychoactive component THC, they are, distinctive, they are distinct strains with unique uh, phytochemical compositions and uses. Hemp has lower concentrations of THC and higher concentrations of cannabinoid oil, or cannabiol, CBD, which decreases or eliminates its psychoactive effects. The legality of industrial hemp varies widely between countries. Some governments regulate the concentration of THC and permit only hemp that is bred with an especially low THC content. 
let's look up cannabis as a drug. I know that it's been smunked throughout history. And again, me erring toward history. <clears throat> cannabis, also known as marijuana among other names, is a psychoactive drug from the cannabis plant used for medical or recreational purposes. The main psychoactive part of cannabis is THC, one of 483 known compounds in the plant, including at least 65 other uh, CBDs. Cannabis can be used by smoking, vaporizing, consumed with food, or as an extract. Cannabis is often used for its mental and physical effects, such as a high or stoned feeling, a general change in perception, heightened mood, and an increase in appetite. Onset of effects is within minutes when smoked, and about 30 to 60 minutes when cooked and eaten. They last for between 2 and 6 hours. Short-term side effects may include a decrease in short-term memory, dry mouth, impaired motor skills, red eyes, and feelings of paranoia or anxiety. Long-term side effects may include addiction, decreased mental ability in those who started as teenagers, and behavioral problems in children whose mothers use cannabis during pregnancy. Studies have found a strong correlation between cannabis use and the risk of psychosis, though the cause and effect relationship is debated. So I guess they don't know, chicken or egg, if the cannabis causes psychosis or those predetermined to have psychosis seek it out. <clears throat> uses. I'm right here at the. Uh, th this is, of course, a long article, as one would expect with something as uh, popular. <clears throat> Let's hit, so the uses, let's look at the spiritual, and then we're going to go scroll down and look at the history. So cannabis has held sacred status in several religions. It has been used in an ethiogenic context, a chemical substance used in a religious, shamanic, or spiritual context, <clears throat> in India and Nepal since the Vedic period, dating back to approximately 1500 BC, but perhaps as far as 2000 BC. There are several references in Greek mythology to a powerful drug that eliminated anguish and sorrow. Herodotus wrote about early ceremonial practices by the, Scythini by the Scythians, thought to have occurred from the 5th to 2nd century BC. In modern culture, the spiritual use of cannabis has been spread by the disciples of the Rastafari movement, used cannabis as a sacrament, and as an aid in meditation. The earliest known reports regarding the sacred status of cannabis in India and Nepal are from the Atharva Veda, estimated to have been written between 2000 and 1400 BC. That's cool. Let's look up the history. I'm all, I'm all about that history. One of these days, I'm going to have a special uh, episode of the podcast where I don't touch on history at all, and I'll probably have to lean heavily on science. So I'll like, start with the Big Bang, which doesn't count because humans weren't around okay that's science at that point oh history of cannabis has its own article i'm there baby <clears throat> the history of cannabis and its uses by humans dates back to at least the third millennium bc in written history and possibly far further back by archaeological evidence for millennia the plant has been valued for its use for fiber and rope and for its psychoactive properties for religious and recreational use the earliest restrictions on cannabis were reported in the Islamic world by the 14th century. In the 19th century, it began to be restricted in colonial countries, often associated with racial and class stresses. In the middle of the 20th century, international coordination led to sweeping restrictions on cannabis throughout most of the globe. Entering the 21st century, some nations began to change their approaches to cannabis, with measures taken to decriminalize it, in 2001, Canada became the first nation to legalize medical cannabis, and in 2015, Uruguay became the first to legalize recreational cannabis. Hmm. So I guess, you know, if you're a fan of the drug, Uruguay's the way. <clears throat> Ancient uses. Cannabis indigenous to Central and South Asia. Hemp is possibly one of the earliest plants to be cultivated. Cannabis has been cultivated in Japan since the pre-Neolithic period, for its fibers and as a food source, and possibly as a psychoactive material. An archaeological site in the Oki Islands near Japan contained cannabis akins, 
which were a type of dry fruit produced by many species of flowering plant, from about 8,000 BC, probably signifying use of the plant. <clears throat> hemp use archaeologically dates back to the Neolithic age in China, with hemp fiber imprints found on Yangshao culture pottery, dating from the 5th millennium BC. The Chinese later used hemp to make clothes, shoes, ropes, and an early form of paper. Cannabis was an important crop in ancient Korea, with samples of hempen fabric discovered dating back to as early as 3000 BC. The earliest written reference to cannabis dates back to 2727 BC from the Chinese emperor Shenong. I feel like I feel like I'm going to have to be super brave to click on an article about Chinese anything because I already have difficulty pronouncing things native to Europe. But Chinese Emperor Shenong kind of caught my fancy. He's got an article all of his own. Let's go there. <laughs> Shenong, which can be variously translated as divine farmer or divine peasant or agricultural god, also known as the Waigushin, the five grains or five cereals god, or Wugu Hyandi, Wugu Hyandi, first deity of the five grains, is a deity in Chinese religion, a mythical sage ruler of prehistoric China. So I guess he was a real ruler who was elevated to the status of godhood afterwards. Shenong ha has at times been counted amongst the three sovereigns, the three kings or three patrons, a group of ancient deities or deified kings. Shenong has been thought to have thought has been thought to have taught the ancient Chinese not only their practices of agriculture, but also the use of herbal drugs. Shenong was credited with various inventions. These include the hoe, the plow, both the Li Si style and the plowshare, the axe, digging wells, agricultural irrigation, preserving stored seeds by using boiled horse urine. Now that, I did not know. The weekly farmer markets. The Chinese calendar, especially the division into the 24 Yakui, or solar terms. And to have refined the therapeutic understanding of taking pulse measurements, acupuncture, and mokibunction. And to have known, and to have instituted the harvest Thanksgiving ceremony. Now, mokibunction is a traditional Chinese medicine therapy, which consists of burning dried mungwort on particular points on the body. So I guess you just put there and light her up. Shenong can also be taken to refer to his people, the Shenong Shi, or the uh, Shenong clan. In Chinese mythology, Shenong, besides having taught humans the use of the plow, together with other aspects of basic agriculture, the use of medicinal plants, and having been a god of the burning wind, <clears throat> perhaps in some relationship to the Yan Emperor mythos and or slash and burn agriculture, in which the ash produced by fire fertilizer fields, was sometimes said to be a progenitor to or have been appointed as one of the ministries. Um, let's look up his historicity, because... That's one of the interesting things about these elevated to godhood kings. There are some parts that are real. There are some parts that aren't. And taking the two, figuring out which is which, is always a fascinating, almost art. <clears throat> Reliable information on the history of China before the 13th century BC can only come from archaeological evidence. Because China's first established written system on a durable medium, the Oracle Bone Script, did not exist until... Thus, the concrete existence of even the uh, Xia dynasty, Xi dynasty, or the Xia dynasty, XIA, said to be the successor, successor to Shenong, is yet to be proven, despite efforts by Chinese archaeologists to link that dynasty with Bronze Age Erlito archaeological sites. However, Shenong, both the individual and the clan, are very important. In the history of culture, especially in regards to mythology and popular culture, 
Indeed, Shinong figures extensively in historical literature. The Oracle Bone Script. I know a little bit about this, uh, and it just so happens, out of pure happenstance, that on a completely Google search, uh, Wikipedia adventure I had by myself, even just yesterday, I happened across the Oracle Bone Script. So that's kind of funny that it's uh, two different adventures diverging on a single point. Maybe as the podcast goes on in length, uh, that'll happen more and more frequently. I suppose as the podcast goes on in length, it can't help but happen more and more frequently. And that's just how statistics works. The Oracle Bone Script was the form of Chinese characters used on Oracle Bones. Animal bones or turtle plastrons used in pyromantic divini- divination in the late second millennium BCE and is the earliest known form of Chinese writing. The vast majority were found at the Yin Qiu site in the modern Anyang Henan, Henan province. They record pyromantic divinations of the last nine kings of the Shang dynasty, beginning with Wu Ding whose ascension is dated by different scholars at 1250 BC or 1200 BC. After the Shang were overthrown by the Zhao dynasty, roughly 1046 BC, divining with milfoil became more common, and very few oracle bone writings date from the early Zhao. Now, what you do uh, in this divination is you would take these bones, you would etch in information, a king, the location, the event, what have you. And you would cast these bones or these uh, turtle plastrons into a fire or subject them to a great heat. Eventually, the bones and plastrons would shatter and crack. And then after they cool down, you take them out and you analyze the cracks. And I suppose, depending on which way the cracks form and where the holes occurred, that tells you what the future is going to be. Let's see. The hmm. Should we look up pyro? Pyromancy. Let's look at pyromancy. We're, we're almost out of time here. Let's maybe end it up with pyromancy. Pyromancy is the art of divination by means of fire. Due to the importance of fire in society from the earliest of times, it is quite likely that pyromancy was one of the forms of divination. It is said that in Greek society, virgins at the Temple of Athena in Athens regularly practiced pyromancy. It is also possible that the followers of Hephaestus, the Greek god of fire and the forge, practiced pyromancy. In Renaissance magic, pyromancy was classified as one of the seven forbidden arts, along with necromancy which is a practice of magic involving communications with the dead. Necromancy, an act of divination that interprets markings on the ground or patterns formed by tossed handfuls of soil, rocks, or sand. Aeromancy, which, as the name suggests, is interpret- uh, divination interpreting atmospheric conditions, so clouds. Hydromancy, uh, divination involving water, including the color, ebb, and flow, or ripples produced by pebbles dropped in a pool. Palm, uh, chiromancy, which is also palmistry, which is, you know, reading of the palm. And spatulomancy, which is by reading a spatula. No, I'm joking, but that does what that is what it sounds like. Uh, is the it's the divination by using the scapula or spiel bones, so uh, essentially divin- divination with bones still. Now there are a list of different ones you can use of different pyromancies. I should say, you can burn plants, you can read the smoke, you can burn the object of in question. You can cast salt onto a fire. You can throw bones onto it, burn laurel leaves, um, or burn salt. That's just that's cool though. That 
<laughs> these uh, pyromantic bones, um, the Oracle bone script was just back then kind of uh, used to tell the future. And now we use those same bones to read the past. It's just kind of an interesting connection. And let's see, I'm looking right here and I'm thinking guys, it's probably about time that I start concluding this podcast. So what did we learn today? Well, we started off with the elephant graveyard and learned that no such place actually exists in that the origins perhaps came from old elephants hanging about with around dead elephants or from the uh, fossil remains of the straight tusked elephant, which is an extinct form of elephant that was native to Europe. <clears throat> now the straight tusked elephant, it's a uh, closest relative is actually the African forest elephant. And the African forest elephant is closer related to the extinct one than he is the African bush elephant. We looked up the Asian elephant, which is an elephant that's actually native to Asia and that lives in, um, and there are three subspecies across it. One of which lives in Sumatra. We looked up Sumatra and learned that it's apparently just got all sorts of just, it's essentially a um, biologist's heaven because it's got the Sumatran tiger, Sumatran elephant, Sumatran no, Sumatran orangutan, but the deforestation has caused all sorts of issues. And in fact, we learned that in 2013, because of a bunch of wildfires, you had the 2000 Southeast Asian haze, which was an event that caused the pollution level about twice as worse, twice as bad as the next largest um, event from the area with a pollution standard index reaching 401. Uh, and it actually caused strain with uh, other islands at the time, one of which was Borneo. We learned that it's actually the third largest island in the world and is controlled by three countries, which I thought was a little fascinating piece of tidbit evidence of, uh, it's just interesting the way that the uh, lines are drawn. We looked at the list of islands by area and we learned that not only is Australia technically not considered an island anymore, according to Wikipedia at the very least, but we also, from there, clicked to Baffin Island, which is the fifth largest in the world and is an island in the Canadian territory of Nunavut. And that even though it has a area of about 195,929 square miles, only about 11,000 people live there. It is a colder inhospitable land, but that didn't stop it from perhaps being South Norse. We looked up the saga of Eric the Red and the, the places that he went in in one of the sagas, the uh, description Hilleland, which is thought to be um, Baffin Island. He also visited Nunavut and he created a um, he had a little cottage there in Greenland, which funny enough, we learned that Greenland was so named because he wanted to attract tourists. Uh, we looked up the Norse colonization of Greenland and that there were no real permanent structures that have yet to be discovered other than one in Newfoundland. And that uh, this was Lance Ach Meadows or O Meadows. This is obviously a French name and, I'm clearly not French, so I am butchering it. Um, we looked up Bratalid, which is the um, name of Eric the Red's estate in the eastern settlement uh, Viking colony in southwestern Greenland. And that uh, there was, in fact, a church there because Leif Erikson was told to go and practice Christianity. We looked at the Longhouse, which is one of the popular structures that were built by Vikings and inhabited by them. And not just Vikings, but Longhouses are, in fact, a popular form of housing throughout most of the world throughout a lot of periods of history. Longhouses being single room buildings that are not terribly wide, but quite long relative to their size. We looked up a Neolithic uh, Longhouse. That Waddle and Dob, which Waddle and Dob is the, 
you take little uh, sticks, weave them together, and then you'll put like clay or mud on the outside as a way to uh, kind of seal it up. I don't think I described that never it, but I think it's important to know. So these long houses were during the Neolithic area era, <clears throat> especially in the linear pottery culture. Uh, the linear pottery culture we learned were, was a culture that formed in about the middle of Europe, and it formed about eh, fifty-five hundred to forty-five hundred BC. And that they would live in these long houses. Uh, we learned that they they had a series of normal kind of crops: the emmer wheat, the acorn wheat, the pea and the lentil. But they also had several that are rarely found in archaeological record and so are considered weeds. This is the one that I was a little skeptical about because, I don't know, barley, millet, rye, those all seem pretty useful, and I wouldn't consider them weeds. Um, we looked up hemp because we knew they grew that. We grew hemp for rope and for fibers, and we learned that it is actually native to the uh, Eurasian continent, we looked up cannabis as a drug and that it has spiritual effects for those who so seek it and that it also has the, um, it historically it's been used and smoked for thousands of thousands of years. It was banned back in, uh, the first banning rather was in the, um, 15th century. I believe I read in the Muslim world and, Later on, kind of other more puritanical um, cultures kind of followed suit with that. The uh, we looked up the history of cannabis, popularly popularly grown in Asia, and then in fact they found it. I think what back eight thousand BC, yeah, near Oki Island they have evidence of it. We looked up Shenong, who was one of these legendary god kings that you so see in history. He belonging to Chinese. We looked up the historicity of him, and it's not known whether or not what he did is true, because the first permanent medium of writing were the oracle bone scripts, which were a form of pyromancy in which you write the prophecies on bones and throw them into the fire. We looked up the pyromancy, and we looked. We realized that it was a uh, form of divination, net magic. They banned that along with necromancy, geomancy, aromancy, hydromancy, palmistry, and spatulomancy. And I think that's it. I think that was the journey we took down the rabbit hole of Wikipedia this week. Thank you guys so much for listening, and uh, as always, have a good day. Bye.